And he's probably in the meetings going, look, I really think you should probably pay him. I'm just thinking, you know, it makes sense, right? They'll go away. I want to make it public. Yeah, hush, hush. Tell no one. (laughs) Smashing Security, Episode 323, Botched Bitcoin Blackmail, I Spoof, and Meta's Billion Dollar Data Bundle, with Carol Terrio and Graham Cluley. Hello, hello, and welcome to Smashing Security episode 323. My name's Graham Cluley. And I'm Carol Terrio. And Carol, who have we got in the hot seat this week joining us? We have Zoe Rose of the Imposter Syndrome Network podcast. Hi, Zoe. Hey. Welcome back, Zoe. Yeah, it's lovely to be back. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. A minute? (laughs) Yeah, I like that expression a lot. It's like saying, I haven't talked to you in ages. Oh, is it? Oh, I see. Yeah. Hmm. Fair enough. (laughs) You could just say it's been an age. (laughs) It's been an age. I could say that too. It's been a while. Tell us about your podcast. Uh, Yeah. Well, I co-host it. So more credit to my co-host because he probably does a lot more than I do. Um, But It uh, is important to give credits to your co-host, isn't it? (laughs) Isn't it? That's what I've been told. I've heard that. I've heard that. (laughs) heard that. (laughs) Imposter Syndrome Network, what is it all about? Yeah, well, it's basically we're interviewing extremely successful people and talking about their journeys, their careers. It's technical careers. So it's anybody from security to engineering to, I don't know, anything you really want to do, Um, Hmm. developers as well. And um, yeah, we're just talking about why the bloody hell they're there, what they're doing and how they got there. And it's been really interesting because some really good advice has been shared about how to overcome not just like feeling like an imposter, but also uh, overcoming mistakes, because that's probably been a huge part of my career is I've made slight errors that have been massive and Who then hasn't though <laughs> well it's it's the best way to learn from my opinion yeah of course if you've lived long enough you haven't fallen flat in your face at least once what's going on what kind of shoes are you wearing i think the thing <laughs> is a lot of us though we look around us and we think oh those people aren't as idiotic as i am but they are and that's the best part yeah <laughs> i'm not sure there's many people that are more idiotic than graham i'm not sure <laughs> Well, okay. Degrees, degrees. <laughs> but but it's it's awesome because it's like we'll interview somebody and the entire time I'm just sat there like, bloody hell, you're so amazing. And then and then they're talking about all these simple things that they've done wrong, and I'm just like, How is that possible? Like, you're just so perfect. <laughs> it's it's just really cool. Well, listeners, go and check out the Imposter Syndrome Network podcast uh to hear more from Zoe and her co host and her guests. Yes. And let's get this podcast on the road. Before we kick off, <laughs> let's thank this week's wonderful sponsors, Bitwarden, Collide, and Centripetal. Their support help us give you this show for free. Now, coming up on today's show, Graham, what do you got? I'm going to be talking about a bizarre Bitcoin blackmail plot. Ooh, nice alliteration. <laughs> what about you, Zoe? I'm talking about... Meta's exceptionally large fine for failing to follow GDPR. And I'm going to talk about why you can't trust caller ID. All this and much more coming up on this episode of Smashing Security. Now, chums, chums, I want to take you back to February 2018. That's where my story is going to begin. And it begins in the offices of an Oxford company, Carole. Oxford Ooh. Biomedica, just down the road from you. Very swanky building, lots of glass. It's near your neck of the woods, Kroll. Um, if you know where Lidl is, near the big I Tesco's. I do know where Lidl is. <laughs> right, opposite Kennington Flooring. Uh, if you go uh, down there. Yes. Oh, you know them as well? All right. They did our floors. Oh. There you go. Yeah. Oxford Biomedica, they are a gene and cell therapy firm. They worked on Parkinson's disease. They've partnered with Microsoft to use their AI and machine learning to work on treatments for a large number of sicknesses. And perhaps most famously, they manufactured a vaccine for COVID-19, Oxford Biomedica. That's right. Uh, And, uh, well, way back, 27th of February 2018, actually, they suffered a cyber attack. What happened was a hacker accessed their systems and senior members of the company received a ransom demand from the attacker. 
Right. Nothing that unusual, really. Kind of thing that happens all the time. Right, Zoe? Well, it happens more than you hear about, to be fair. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah. as far as I've been able to work out, Oxford Biomedica never went public about this particular attack. I did oh. search, and uh, it doesn't look like they, they ever actually uh, admitted it. But anyway, uh, it's now come out into the open mm-hmm. <laughs> because of the story I'm about to tell you. So, a hacker accessed their systems. Senior members of the company receive the ransom demand. And what do the bosses at the company do? What do you do when you receive Pay the demand? Pay them and get them to go away. Exactly. Shh, shh, shh. Here you are. Here's We're the money. Here's here. the... Clear off. Clear off. Why don't I mean, you? <laughs> that's better than pretending it was a security researcher for a bug bounty, isn't it? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. Don't take the Uber route. Yeah, exactly. Don't do that. <laughs> well, what they decided to do was they brought in the IT boffins. So they have people, obviously, inside their company, IT experts, and they said, look, we've received this email, slightly worrying, have we been hacked? What should we do? And so they brought in the geeks inside the company, which included a 23-year-old IT security analyst called Ashley Lyles. Okay, security analyst. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And Ashley and his, I guess it just means he worked on the IT security team. You know, analyst right, right, right. is one of those sort of you know names, isn't it? Ashley and his colleagues, they worked alongside the police, to try to mitigate the incident, find out what was going on. Uh, because obviously there, there was the threat that maybe a hacker had broken in, stolen sensitive information, maybe planning to leak it. They were obviously demanding money as well from the company. And they did this on the QT, right? They, did they, did, is this Ashley guy, was he under NDA to do it on the hush hush? Well, Ash, Ashley's just one of the employees. It's, employee. it's like any... Oh, yeah. right, right. Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. I thought he was a consultant brought in. I'm oh, sorry. no, no, no. Yeah. He's working yeah. for Oxford Biomedica. Ah. He's, he's on the staff. I feel like I know where this story is going. Oh. Right. So. Because, cause, yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> I feel for Ashley right now, I think. You think? I, I don't think so. I feel, okay. like, I feel like you're uncovering a... Okay. I'm I'm going to I'm going to believe in them until proven. <laughs> okay, quite right, Crow. Quite Thank right. You. I like I like your attitude. And um, Zoe, <laughs> you're just so cynical. Anyway. <laughs> but it's an interesting story, and interesting stories always have a not so ethical situation. So I feel like I feel like I know where it's going. All right. All right. Come on. I'm just excited, come on. though. I'm excited. Can everyone just calm down? Calm down, right? I'm telling you the story. Here we go. Right. So Ashley <laughs> and his colleagues are looking into the incident. They've got the blackmail email. They've got the communications mm. which are going on. They're trying to work out, have we been compromised? Has any data been taken? They're working alongside the police. The thing is, mm-hmm. Ashley's company, Oxford Biomedica, and his colleagues and the cops didn't know that Ashley had plans of his own. Ooh. Oh, you darn it. <laughs> it's not to give it to charity, the, right? The giveaway was <laughs> that they were actually named because you're saying Ashley and Colin. Yes, the fact that I'd named an individual. You're so clever, Zoe, yes. <laughs> no, I'm just a little bit suspicious. <laughs> it's like watching an Agatha Christie. If you, if you have a... <laughs> it's not yeah. going to be the extra who hasn't got a name. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's going to be someone with a name. You're absolutely Special right. guest star. <laughs> now, you're probably thinking, oh, Ashley must have been the guy behind the attack. He must be the one who hacked. He must have been the one who sent the ransom note. No, no, no. He didn't. He was just a regular IT security guy at a company which happened to get hacked, which happened to receive a ransom demand. Okay. But, but. what he did was he accessed the private email account of a board member at Oxford Biomedica, the one who'd received the ransom demand from the hacker. Yeah, post, post ransom demand. Post ransom demand. Now, right, okay. It was the typical kind of ransom email, right? Which just says, pay us or your toast, just pay X hundred thousand pounds worth of Bitcoin into this cryptocurrency wallet. And maybe you can understand why an IT guy inside your company would want to see that email, maybe want to access the member of staff's email account with their permission once or twice to see what the hacker had demanded, if there were any follow-up emails, et cetera, et cetera. That, I think, would be understandable. That'd be understandable. Mm -hmm. But what Ashley did was he accessed the board member's email account over 300 times. (laughs) Yeah, doesn't have a good memory. And what's more, (laughs) what's more, he took the original blackmail email stored on their email server and he changed it. 
the actual <laughs> ransom the account numbers. <laughs> yes, the ransom demand, <laughs> which included a Bitcoin wallet. Can you just send it to Barclays? Sort no, code. No, no. <laughs> He changed it so it was a different Bitcoin wallet where the money had to be sent. Invoice oh, redirection. I kind of admire <laughs> Ashley. He, he, uh, I do. I, I, I love the, I, this is going to work. This is going to work. <laughs> Who's going to find out? Business email compromise, you know. He's like Dexter, man. He's on both sides. You see, yeah. when I heard that he'd changed the ransom email, I thought it would change the demand. So he'd say something like, please, can we eat donuts again in the office? Or can the toilet paper be improved <laughs> in the yeah. stuff loose? Or Can we not get fired if we photograph our butts on the yeah. end of the coffee machine? <laughs> Don't serve fish yeah. on Fridays. It makes the whole office stink. You could All kinds of things you could yeah. put in the ransom demand for a bit of fun. But no, he changed the Bitcoin wallet address to which the ransom should be paid. Yeah. And so he's playing the game. Are they going to pay it or are they not going to pay it? And he's probably in the meetings going, look, I really think you should probably pay it. I'm just thinking, you know, it makes sense, right? They'll go away. I don't want to make it public. Yeah, hush, hush. Tell no one. Oh, so, <laughs> and also, also, who's going to believe the criminal? The cyber criminal is like, you didn't pay it. It's like, yeah, we did. We have proof. Poor old criminals are going to feel like they've been defrauded. They say, hang on, yeah. hang on a minute. What's Meanwhile, going on? Meanwhile, he's flying out of there. Sayonara. That's so, brilliant. So he changed the, the crypto wallet address. Brilliant. So he would end up with the cash if the company decided to. Brilliant. Well, I Brilliant. guess that. I didn't think you were yeah. going to. I would watch this movie. I'm just saying, anyone out there who's movie writer, this is a good one. Furthermore, he created an almost identical email address to the one which was used by the original hacker. And he began to email his employers at Oxford Biomedica, pressurizing them to pay the money. It was just sort of applying the thumb screws, going, well, you know, you, your date is going to get it. You know, that you kind of think thing. people that work there that would get these emails are pretty smart and might have spotted the little, you know. Well, no, they, they were leaving it with the IT security team. They wouldn't, the, the, the board member <laughs> wouldn't notice. Oh, that's true. He'd bring it down to IT and go, this is weird. And go, no, 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 that's perfectly normal. That so happens all the time, Ashley would say. He's argument with himself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Arrives on Ashley's desk. He says, no, this looks legit. It looks like it's from the hacker to me. <laughs> <laughs> Great story, Graham. So oh, police brilliant. officers from Southeast Regional Organised Crime Unit, uh, the cyber crime unit there, they identified that someone had been accessing the board member's email, traced the hack back to Lars' home address, presumably his IP address, which makes me think he, he didn't cover his tracks properly. It's unclear whether he's using a well, VPN or not. let's be honest, though. Security and IT are different things. Mm. And then also, even in security, operational security and, you know. Yeah. Those are different paths. So I could understand he, he maybe didn't think of all of the wow. solutions. And um, it takes one time, right? Yeah, you only have to goof once. Could have been. Hmm. Anyway, the police, they grabbed his computer, laptop and phone and a USB stick to analyse them. Now, apparently Ashley Lyles had realised the police investigation was heating up. So a few days before he was raided. Can you imagine how he felt? Fuck, fuck, fuck. Yeah. So he wiped all the data from his devices. <laughs> and you'd be snapping at everybody, shut up! <laughs> I mean... I think this guy, oh. it, it's quite a genius, um, yes. but I do actually feel bad for him. I know yeah. that's silly because, you know, obviously. He's 23. He was know. young at the time. He was yeah. 23. I mean, technically his brain is fully developed because that's like 21, isn't it? But he might never have thought about doing this unless the hackers did it in the first instance. And he just yeah. got on the train and thought. Opportunistic, oh, I think. Yeah, yeah, opportunistic. Exactly. So, that's what he should put in his CV. So. <laughs> <laughs> so he tried to delete the data before the police get there, and he did zap the data, but apparently he didn't do it very securely. So that's his mistake number two. Um, uh, so that's another skill set as well. Yeah, empty trash doesn't always work, right? So, yeah, so he, mm. he'd failed to properly wipe the data. He needs to upskill. Yep. Mm. Uh, put that on his CV, training required. <laughs> so the cops were able to recover his data. Anyway, back in 2018, he denied any involvement. It's taken forever to go through the courts. He asked for £300,000 ransom. He was denying everything until this week at Reading Crown Court. He did finally plead guilty and he is due to be sentenced, I think, uh, 
in July. I was a juror, so I I would have loved this case. I would have loved it. Well, they could have called on you, Crow. You are local. You could have gone down there. Yes. You know, shared your expertise. This would have been <laughs> awesome. <laughs> if you were popping down to Lidl or Kennington Flooring, you could have just popped over the road. I would love that. <laughs> Zoe, what are you going to talk to us about this week? My story is about Meta. And we all know that social media is not really well known for privacy practices. Mm. (laughs) But uh, Meta decided somewhere in their processes that if people signed uh, standard contractual clauses, uh, apparently is the term, but Mm -hmm. people signed it, the the consumers of Facebook, specifically this fine is related to Facebook, um, then they can transfer the data from the EU to the US. Uh, And it was since the 16th of July, 2020. So at the time they had that whole um, agreement with transferring data between US and EU, but obviously that was recently decided, but that wasn't good enough. Um, But they were still sending masses amounts of data consistently from the EU to the US because people sign those clauses and they're like, it's okay. Um, well, So the users are agreeing to the terms and conditions. Is that what you're saying? So Essentially, yeah. You sign up for Facebook, you say, right. you know, you accept their policy, whatever, um, the terms and conditions that nobody reads, including myself. Um, yeah. well, <laughs> well, no, that's not true. There are privacy people that do actually read these things. They are excellent people. Me, Crow Terrier. <laughs> exactly. Um, not something I'm good at, but, you know. Crow does it for us so we don't have to. Oh, and that's why we love you. I yeah. just like looking to see what they try and hide in them. It's a, well, it's a weird hobby. Well, this is one hobby. of the things they tried to hide, I suppose. Uh-huh. Um, so... So the argument's really interesting. So basically you're saying inside the EULA or whatever privacy notice, they're saying, yeah, yeah, we transfer data to and back from the States. We've got an agreement. Cool, cool, cool. And then when you sign it, you've effectively agreed to it. And that's what they're using as their argument. Essentially, yeah, Mm -hmm. because it's just the way that they're processing the data. So in organizations, you know, you send data to wherever you store your data and you process it or whatever, and it makes sense. The problem is... They did the new data in America, which mm-hmm. you're not allowed to do without having appropriate protections. Um, and I think the reason it was that the American agreement or whatever was declined essentially is because they didn't have appropriate protections protecting European data from uh, what was the term they used? The spy agencies or something? Oh, well, the intelligence um, agencies. Yeah, intelligence and surveillance. Agencies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's why it was declined or whatever. But the thing is. Because they did this on a consistent process and it's essentially all the data, like it's a massive amount of data, uh, they are being issued with, or they've been issued with, the largest GDPR fine ever. How much is it? 1.2 billion euros. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. I mean, let's be honest, how likely are they actually going to pay that amount? Uh, I don't know. This does feel like a good opportunity to have an enormous party. We should stop the podcast right now just because the thought... Or Facebook possibly having to pay over a billion dollars well, okay, is but, rather wonderful, isn't it? But but let's look at that though. I looked at another article and uh, it says May the twenty fifth of May will be the fifth anniversary of GDPR. Blah blah blah. Privacy Affairs has tracked the fines and all one thousand seven hundred one of them for a grand total of over four billion American dollars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Meta accounts for fifty percent of all GDPR fines. Wow. 50%. Yeah. 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 They are keeping EU running. (laughs) Well, the GDPR fines, as I recall, uh, it can be based upon how much money your company makes, can't it? I think it's like, okay, don't don't quote me. I think it's 4% of the annual turnover. I I think think you're right. I think that sounds right. I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe they chose to do the full amount that they can actually owe. And I feel like this probably has something to do with the fact that they've been fined multiple times. So I yes. think they've just been like, bloody hell, like, I'm I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> just bloody pay us because we're, you know. But, yeah. but here's the other part that I found really interesting. It wasn't just that they have to pay a fine. It's mm-hmm. also that they have to uh, become compliant so it says, um, yeah, so actually, uh, if you follow Privacy Matters on Twitter, he's a lovely man, um, and he clarifies a lot of privacy 
issues and concerns and uh, like news. I found him so interesting. But uh, so he's highlighted on his Twitter the three demands, essentially, the require Meta Ireland to suspend any future transfers of personal data to the US within a period of five months. That mm-hmm. might sound long. That is not long. I remember when we had a year uh, to prepare for GDPR and there were people, there were organizations that were like, within this year, we won't even know if we're able to be compliant. But mm-hmm. they've got to do this in five months. And then they've got that 1.2 billion euro fine, which is mm-hmm. quite exceptional. And then also... Yeah. They have to bring its processing operations into compliance with Chapter 5 of the GDPR by ceasing any unlawful processing, including storage in the U.S. of personal data of EU EEA users within six months. So hmm. in the next five to six months, they have to have a massive, massive digital transformation. They also have to pay an exceptional fee. But you know what? Like, I'm just looking here, like, apparently in 2022, Facebook's ad revenues hit $135.9 billion. It's still a hefty fine, though, Carol. It's a hefty fine. And it's all the upheaval caused by trying to fix this to try and become compliant. Well, it's going to be a challenge. Well, this is their normal business process, right? And they have to change their entire business process, which as we know, is very difficult to do, especially at that scale. And I well, think it's not that they haven't had like years of warning that this oh, might no, come. No, right. And this is why when they changed the name to Meta, I thought it was absolutely hilarious because when I think of Meta, I think of Metadata, which is like, hey, we've got all your data. <laughs> I think they claimed it was beyond, beyond yeah, advertising. Yeah. So but I, I was like, no, 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 it's the data that, they, you know, but whatever. Um, but I think the other interesting thing is not only is this a scary big thing that's going to happen for them. But also, is this setting a precedent? Are are other organizations going to be less likely to want to transfer, like do you want to deal with EU data or is they going to, are they going to be more cautious, hopefully? Um, Because the risk of misalignment is quite an exceptional fine. I also wonder whether, I mean, a company like Facebook will have employees all based around the world sort of helping their users in different areas Mm -hmm. and working on the data. And maybe we're going to begin to see more silos of people dotted around different parts of the world rather than just in one Mm -hmm. single place. So the data doesn't have to be moved to that part of the world in order to do some work. But here's the thing, Graham, that I don't understand is we had these conversations when GDPR <laughs> was coming out. Exactly. And, and there were so many discussions about, oh, where is our data centers? Do we have them, you know, not just do we have them in different locations for resilience, but also do we have EU specific, you know, when we go to get contracts with third parties, do they keep their data in the EU? Like, this is not new. No. No, that's true. But they're Facebook. They probably think they're above the law. It's just embarrassing. Yeah, and how much money did they make by not following the law for the last four years? And how many situations have they caused? How many political, how many not-so-ethical situations have been associated with Facebook Mm. in general? It's almost like a, well, is it really financially worth it to care? Whoa, sorry, sorry. So wait, are you saying we shouldn't trust Facebook? What? <laughs> Seriously? What? Come on. What the hell's Jeez. going on? <laughs> and now a word from our sponsors, Facebook. <laughs> Do apologise about Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> We're not having her back. <laughs> Carol, what have you got for us this week? Uh, well, I just wanted to talk about life as a hacker, because... It can't be easy, right? The poor little sausages, stressful. You got to lie and cheat. You got to love up lonely grannies. You know, you have to dupe staff members into giving you credentials. And and all the time, you can't tell anybody. You got to stay on the down low. You never reveal like, ha ha, I'm the one who did this. And it's got to be difficult. I mean, Graham, I bet even if you like empty the dishwasher, I'm sure if someone's around, you'd be like, I just want you to know. <laughs> I what? emptied the dishwasher because <laughs> you wouldn't want to get the points. You wouldn't want you know them to think someone else had emptied the dishwasher. I did turn on the dishwasher earlier today. I just like to tell everyone that. Did you tell anyone? No, there was no one else here to tell. 
I'm telling you. I'm telling all the listeners. <laughs> all the listeners. But you see, your typical hacker, they can't go around showing off, right? They have to say shum. Yes. Because if the information gets into the wrong hands, they got to say sayonara to their big fat bank accounts, their big houses, their yachts, golden slippers. I mean, how many malicious actors were caught because they were bragging? So. But there must be many, many that are like smarter than that in Station. So, so if anonymity is key, you might be tempted by a service that claims to guarantee that for you, ensuring that if the authorities got wind of a cyber heist, you know, they would have no idea who was behind the crime. A privacy service for the hackers. A privacy service for the hackers. Excellent. And this is how sites like iSpoof.cc get mm-hmm. fill a very necessary business gap. Now, we spoke about iSpoof.cc in our 300th episode, but I wanted to revisit the story because there's been some very interesting news that broke only this week. So to recap, this is like an underground website created in 2020 that sold spoofing services to ne'er-do-wells, you know, people that wanted to pretend they were someone else. And the business model was very simple. You know, for a handsome fee, iSpoof would allow its users to display a false caller ID, okay, one that matched the services they are pretending to be, which were normally banks. So were you to get one of these calls, they say they were from your bank saying that maybe there was suspicious activity on your account and you wisely would look at the caller ID number and say, oh my God, that is correct. That is my bank. You'd be inclined you know, to tell, you know, to think the call is legitimate and provide any information they requested, right? Uh, absolutely. If it's a spoofed number, if it, if my phone tells me it's you calling, Carol, then I yeah. expect to hear your voice at the other yeah. end. You'll go, what up, and, asshole? <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's that's how I would tell it was you rather than someone <laughs> pretending to be you. No, no, I was saying that's what you would answer. <laughs> and, oh, I see. Oh, Yes. <laughs> That's right. And I, I don't want to upset a fraudster who's pretending to be you. So I, I, I you know, so, so <laughs> but anyway, yes, you're absolutely right. If you spoof someone's phone number, then it, it's a large part of the social engineering you've already got. It. I think it's important to note that it's actually not difficult to do. So if you mm-hmm. do trust by default, um, for people that aren't aware, uh, don't do that. <laughs> I was going to say something witty, but I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, but it's one of those things, though, that like somehow, even though you know that, yeah. you would, you know. It does give the caller a sense of authority. Yeah, it's just like showing up with a business card. You know, I might have printed it that at home with my fancy printer, but it doesn't actually mean anything. Yeah. Now, iSpoof, what made them particularly uh, successful is they didn't just focus on a single geography. This operation was global, baby, right? At its peak, it had almost 60,000 users who paid up to five wow. grand a month in Bitcoin to access a the month. software. Yeah. Could you imagine how much they made, though, if they're paying that much money? It's incredible. iSpoof was reportedly used to make 10 million fraudulent calls worldwide. Forty uh, percent were in the U.S. and thirty-five percent were in the U.K. And at one point, they say as many as twenty people every minute were being targeted by callers using technology bought from IceBooth website. So big deal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they say that the IceBooth services is said to have helped fraudsters nab around a hundred million from victims all around the world. Hmm. Now, in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two. It was part of an investigation by numerous law enforcement agencies. We talked about this bit in the episode 300. So you can go listen to that. It was shut down in November 2022 as a result of Operation Elaborate. That was the name. And this was a multi-agency investigation. So you had the Met, the Netherlands Police, Europol, and Eurojust. Yep. But what happened to iSpoof.cc ringleader TJ Fletcher, right? Because he got arrested as part of this. Not T.J. Hooker. T.J. Fletcher. T.J. Fletcher. Okay, it wasn't, it, it wasn't Shatner. It wasn't William Shatner who was behind this. <laughs> no. no. It wasn't no. Shatner. Okay. No. <laughs> but he was, he was found guilty for running this complex banking scam in the UK courts. And just a few days ago, he was sentenced to 13 years in the claim. Interesting. That doesn't take very long. 
No, see, I thought it seemed like a long time in the UK. Uh, okay. Yeah, that does seem a lot for the UK, yeah. Yeah. And what makes this case kind of, uh, well, makes it completely unusual for me is that... Can, can, I, can I guess? Mm-hmm. Can I guess what the unusual thing yes. is? Was he also hit by a GDPR fine? Because I'm thinking if they have that <laughs> many customers with that many accounts and that much money sloshing around, they must have been accessing Europe. And it's global. Exactly. I'm thinking, let's stop imprisoning people yeah. for the scams. Let's just get them for GDPR. It's the old Al Capone thing, isn't it? Where they got him for tax evasion. Love it. Love it. <laughs> I was just thinking, wow, you made a GDPR joke. That's amazing. <laughs> let's call the Irish uh, commissioner, get them on the phone. Yeah. Why not? Sorry, Carol, carry on. Tell me more about TJ Fletcher. <laughs> But what makes it kind of unusual, though, mm. is that the thousands who lost money through all these sophisticated scams, mm. right, were not direct victims of Fletcher or no. his junior partners. But he did create the opportunity. Exactly. Oh, but so I manufactured a hammer, Zoe, and other people chose to take the hammer and smash people's windows. Are you going to imprison I mean, me? That's To me, that's a little bit different, though, because you're not advertising your hammer as effective murdering devices. No, no, no not necessarily, but it could be a, a, a device for maybe, you know, if you if you wanted to bruise a pineapple or something like that, <laughs> then it would be, a, or, you know, if you wanted to crack a coconut in half, there's all kinds of ways of presenting it. I suppose it. that's true. It is, it is a slippery slope. You do make a good point because it is a slippery slope. Because- I spoof could be advertised as a practical joke service where you call up people claiming to be their auntie. Or training. Yes. Yeah, if they yes. just had an emoji in the corner with laughing emoji, that's that, their <laughs> icon. Yeah. Or it could also be like, um, you know, you, privacy. You don't want people to know who you are or what your number is. Yes, that's that's also possible. Yes, if I'll be prepared to pay £5,000 <laughs> worth of Bitcoin a month for such <laughs> practical joke facility. The prosecution <laughs> described the business setup. They were effectively luring criminals oh. into the service is what they, they were accused of. They were manipulating criminals to be criminals. Naughty. So it was really the copywriters that I spoof hired who wrote the content for the web pages. It's not this poor TJ Fletcher guy who was just too busy running his site and didn't realise what the bloody marketing people had written on some of the web pages. I should have been on his defence team. Oh, really? I could have got him off this. (laughs) Objection, Your Honour. I mean, you do make a slightly interesting point, though, because... Slightly interesting. (laughs) Slightly interesting. I didn't say overly. Um, (laughs) But but with the skill set that I have to develop in my career... Funnily, run into situations where people are like, "I don't trust you because you're a hacker," and I'm like, "No, not really." And they're like, "No, no, no you're you're going to hack me," and I'm like, "Why <laughs> would I hack you?" You know, like like such a weird thing. Rude. But also, but also, but that's a valid point. I mean, if I create a solution that's very privacy focused, does that mean I'm enabling hackers? Yeah, I you see, you see, it's deep. That's deep, Zoe. It's not appropriate for this podcast. <laughs> this kind of depth of thinking, I think we've. <laughs> Yes, let's Broke move on. on. <laughs> Smashing security listeners, did you know that Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work? Bitwarden's password manager securely stores credentials spanning across personal and business worlds, and every Bitwarden account begins with the creation of a personal vault, which allows you to store all your personal credentials. These are unique and secure passwords for every single account you access. And it's easy to set up. It's easy to use. I honestly love Bitwarden. I use it at home, use it at work, use it on the go. Get started with a free trial of a teams or enterprise plan at bitwarden.com forward slash smashing. Or you can even try it for free across devices as an individual user. Check it out at bitwarden.com forward slash smashing. And thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring the show. 
Now, there's some big news from our sponsor, Collide. If you are an Okta user, they can get your entire fleet up to 100% compliant. How do they do that, you're asking yourself? Well, if a device isn't compliant, the user can't log into your cloud apps until they fix the problem. It's that simple. Collide patches one of the major holes in zero trust architecture, which is device compliance. Without Collide, IT struggles to solve basic problems like keeping everyone's OS and browser up to date. Unsecured devices are logging into your company's apps because there's nothing there to stop them. Collide is the only device trust solution that enforces compliance as part of authentication and it's built to work seamlessly with Okta. The moment Collide's agent detects a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions on how to fix it. If they don't fix the problem, within a set time, they are blocked. Collide means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Visit collide.com slash smashing to learn more or to book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash smashing. Smashing Security is also brought to you by Centripetal. Centripetal is the global leader in intelligence-powered cybersecurity. The company operationalizes the world's largest collection of threat intelligence in real time to protect your company from every known cyber threat. Now available as a cloud-based deployment, Centripetal's clean internet service is a revolutionary approach to defending your assets from cyber threats by leveraging dynamic threat intelligence on a mass scale. The addition of AWS Clean Internet Cloud protects your enterprise, whether on-premise, remote, or in the cloud, removing the need for a more costly cybersecurity infrastructure. Learn more about Centripetal's intelligence-powered cybersecurity solutions at smashingsecurity.com slash centripetal. That's C-E-N-T-R-I-P-E-T-A-L. And thanks to Centripetal for sponsoring the show. And welcome back. Can you join us our favorite part of the show, the part of the show that we like to call Pick of the Week. Pick of the Week. Pick of the Week. Pick of the Week is the part of the show where everyone chooses something they like. Could be a funny story, a book that they've read, a TV show, a movie, a record, a podcast, a website, or an app. Whatever they wish. It doesn't have to be security-related necessarily. Better not be. Well, my Pick of the Week this week is not security-related. I love a doc. Oh, I love a documentary. Mm. I love a good documentary. I'm not really interested in that drama nonsense so much. But give me a documentary and I'll be very, very happily eating my popcorn. And I have been watching a documentary. Uh, this week, not for very long, because it's only sixteen minutes long. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's sixteen minutes long. That is the shortest documentary I've ever heard it's of. It's a micro documentary, and why not? Why I not? I think you know we're exactly. all busy. Yeah, if it if that contains the whole story, then it's wonderful. The documentary is called "John Was Trying to Contact Aliens." <laughs> <laughs> what a gloriously interesting title! This is a documentary on Netflix about an electronics whiz called John Shepard, and he spent 30 years of his life all on his own, not really making any friends, poor chap, trying to find extraterrestrial life from his cottage in rural Michigan. What do you mean, poor guy? I think he probably had the time of his life. I mean, he was trying to make friends, alien friends. Well, well yeah, he was trying to make, he, he was doing his bit. That's what he was yeah. into from a young age. He was interested in contact and extraterrestrial life. And unlike the rest of us who, I don't know, may have filled up a balloon with helium and thought maybe it'll get through the atmosphere or how about I write a really large word in the crop circle, he actually built transmitters, enormous amounts of electronic wizardry, which began to dominate his grandparents' sitting room. In the documentary, you begin to see pictures of the grandparents sort of uh, sat in front of the TV, you know, on a typical evening, and they're just surrounded by all this electronics and this bearded <laughs> guy. <laughs> and he's playing jazz. He's playing world music into space. I think I'd like him. Yeah. Right. I incredible array of electronics. And then he gets really serious and thinks, I have to take this up a notch because just going a bit past the moon with my transmissions isn't going to be powerful enough. I need to send them further. 
Now, this documentary isn't really about aliens. It's actually about love. And I'm not going to give away everything which happens in the documentary because it is only 16 minutes long. Yeah, you've been talking for five. <laughs> it's the third through. <laughs> and, but it's a heartwarming, lovely documentary, which I'd recommend to everyone. It's called John Was Trying to Contact Aliens. And I really enjoyed it. And so I wanted to share it with you two and all of our gorgeous listeners today. And it is my pick of the week. Lovely. Sounds great. So, Zoe, what's your pick of the week? Yeah, my pick of the week is I wanted to highlight things that have helped me uh, with insomnia. Uh, oh. Yeah, well, I, I had really severe insomnia for many, many years, like exceptionally bad, where I would only sleep like two hours at a time. Um, and then now I'm a mum and sleeping is vital, but also not very readily available so mm -hmm. <laughs> i figured here's some ideas that i've had that have worked for me in the past mind mm -hmm. you if it is really severe i would still recommend seeing a doctor going to your gp <laughs> but yeah so one of the ones that i the most important thing for me was eye covers and i know that sounds really silly but like you mean um, like an eye mask yeah 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 right right yeah because i've bought many and i've always found them very rubbish and then i was feeling, I don't know, silly, I guess, and ended up spending probably more than I expected I would spend on an eye mask. I think it was How like... How much did you spend, Zoe? <laughs> it wasn't crazy, but it was like, I think the one I bought was probably just shy of 30 euro or pounds because I was in the UK at the time. Quite expensive. But I did add a link because I think that one wasn't quite that much. Um, and I don't know if that's the exact model I have, but um, it's similar. It looks similar to the one I have. Okay, so we're going to put a link in the show notes where people can check out your eye mask or something similar to your eye mask. Is yeah, that right? similar. Okay. And um, and I actually noticed it made a huge, huge impact because it was also a routine. It was like uh, not just that I put the mask on and I went to sleep. That didn't happen. But I put the mask on and I didn't look at my phone because I have my mask on. And if I do that, I have to take it off. And, you know, um, I didn't, you know, look around the room. It made me focus, like forced me to focus. It's like going into those, um, uh, what is it called where you reduce the senses what is it or like an isolation tank yeah sensory deprivation yeah mm. that's the word yeah. or term um it's not to the extreme obviously you, you could still hear and everything but uh but it forced me to be in the dark and um and it was this routine that when i started to get a bit tired i put it on and it required me not to do anything because i have a very short attention span and uh, i'm not so good at that so it's had a huge impact in my sleeping quality um which has been great yeah. But for people that do not like textures or certain things on their face, which I understand, I'm very picky about materials. Um, there's also the option of blackout curtains. And if you rent, like me, you don't want to install them and you don't really usually have the money to buy really fancy curtains anyway. And so what I found is it's suction cup based um blackout blinds so it's basically ah. blackout material but they suction cup to your window and so you can remove them so mm. they're good for travel they're good for a variety of sizes of room because you can suction and then they also have velcro to reduce the size if you need to they're ah. not perfect but it does make your room quite a bit darker because you put it on there and then you put your curtains that you do have over and yes it's quite quite helpful I just learned about these things because I have a friend who has um, a, a slopey roof, like a window. What's it called? A, a V-Lux window. And the, the, one of their kids sleeps in that room. And now that the sun's out all the time. Um, but getting a blind in that in that shape yeah. was super expensive. So I was just like suction cups. And we looked it up and there they were. Yeah. So yeah, no, really cool. Makes such a smart idea. Making the room darker specifically was what made a huge benefit to me. Um, the suction cup. Uh, solution was interesting. I fall asleep listening to podcasts. If I can't sleep, I just put on a podcast. I literally will fall asleep within <laughs> probably five minutes. Well, I'm not a fan of you right now. <laughs> I'm not saying your podcast, Zoe. <laughs> no, I just, I'm just jealous. <laughs> <laughs> 
Carol, what's your pick of the week? Well, I'm making Netflix's Jewish matchmaking my pick of the week. So last week I had a lot of mundane tasks to do, you know, like signing stuff, putting things in bags, all kinds of, because I was doing this little art thing. And I needed something that was good, but not great, right? So <laughs> so this is a good, but not great pick of the week. Sometimes you need that in life. You know, you need something that's kind of interesting, but not fascinating. I 100% understand. I need the background noise. Exactly. It's a background noise thing that you want to look up occasionally and kind of go, huh. And that's about it. So I'm not a reality TV. Uh, no, I don't have a, a much knowledge of this area. But, you know, occasionally I binge, a bit like, you know, Doritos. You know, sometimes you just need to have a few cool wrenches. So I was talking to my friend telling him about I needed something like this. And he said, try this show. He said, all his friends, all his Jewish friends love it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, typical reality show, you have all these beautiful people who say they're looking for love or looking to start a family. Uh -huh. And they hit up our Eliza Ben Shalom. She's our very Jewish matchmaker queen to find them the perfect person. And so a typical scene will be like Eliza's talking to her 30-year-old client, Ori, about, his, about the date uh, she sent him on with a gorgeous, vivacious, intelligent, brown-eyed, brunette, Israeli, Jewish <laughs> actor who spoke Hebrew, okay? And how did it go? Meh, says Ori. She wasn't the gorgeous, vivacious, intelligent, blue-eyed, blonde, Israeli, Jewish woman who spoke Hebrew that he requested, was she? He, he also requested big <clears throat> as well, didn't he? <laughs> I've watched this, Carol. When I saw that you were going to recommend this, I've actually spent this afternoon watching a couple of episodes of this in readiness for the so recording. So what do you think? What do you think? Do you understand what I mean? <sighs> I, I know what you mean about it being casual wallpaper TV. It's not entirely gripping, and some of these people are horrendous. <laughs> I liked the very first woman on it because she was looking for a man with strong eyebrows. And yes, I was like, hey. Like that down. <laughs> she was like, she's like, she had beautiful eyebrows. She was like, my eyebrows are beautiful, and I would like someone who has beautiful eyebrows too. Strong eyebrows. Strong there eyebrows. Are. I there's someone out there for I me. Can, I can relate to her because I do not have strong eyebrows uh -huh. and I actually despise my oh. eyebrows. They're white. So I have to draw them on. <laughs> you can always get a Sharpie. <laughs> yeah, not really. That would look kind of ridiculous. <laughs> oh, okay. But, but also, my daughter has white eyebrows and I feel very guilty for passing that down to her. You should. You totally should. Yeah, that's awful. You should. That's, that's awful totally of you. your fault. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible mother. Terrible. I'm saving up for her to get <laughs> as many tattooed eyebrows as she wants. That is my requirement. <laughs> well, look, while you're pondering that, maybe you want to check out Jewish Matchmaking. You're on Netflix. Guardian gave it three out of five. I think I'd agree. <laughs> well, that just about wraps up the show for this week. Zoe, I'm sure lots of our listeners would like to follow you online and find out what you're up to. What's the best way for folks to do that? We've got Twitter, which I'm Rosec Ops, and then Mastodon, which I'm rosec.techfielddane.net. Yeah. You can use Morse code. <laughs> Smoke signals. Y yeah, you could try that. I probably won't see it, but you could try. <laughs> and you can follow us on Twitter at Smash In Security. No G, Twitter and Mouse to have a G. And there's also a Smash In Security Mastodon account. And make sure never to miss another episode. Follow Smash and Security in your favourite podcast apps such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Overcast. And huge shout out to this episode's sponsors, Collide, Centripetal and Bitwarden. And of course, to our wonderful Patreon community. It's thanks to them all that this show is free. For episode show notes, sponsorship info, guest lists and the entire back catalogue of more than 322 episodes, check out smashingsecurity.com. Until next time. Cheerio. Bye bye. Bye. Rose. Sorry. <laughs> Yo, Rose. <laughs> hey, Rose, why aren't you saying goodbye to the audience? What's your problem, Rose? Oh. Cheers. Yeah, that'll do. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Just polite. I'm so bad at cues. <laughs> <laughs>